I'm Nick Gold. I'm the Director of Business Development at Chesapeake Systems. That means I kind of fancy myself a technology consultant, but really I try to coax people out of their money. Um, our information here, um, chesa.com, I and my colleague Merrill Davis do a every other week audio podcast um, kind of about all different sorts of media technology. I encourage you to listen to it. You can just do a Google search or go on iTunes. It's called The Workflow Show. It, tends to be workflow oriented, if you hadn't guessed. And um, this is going to maybe be a little different than a lot of SIMPTE meetings, uh, presentations that you guys have heard. In fact, I gave pretty much the same talk to the DC SIMPTE chapter a few months ago. Yeah. Went over pretty well. I didn't get as pilloried publicly as I was expecting. And um, the name of the presentation is TV in the 21st, and the focus of concentration is ultra-high definition television. No, just kidding. It's not, because I think it's a bunch of BS. Um, it's all about how I think the very nature of television and broadcast is changing very dramatically right now, and it's shaking up a lot of things, both in terms of business and technology. So over the top, OTT, this is the subject. Um, it basically means sending video over the internet, and I'll get more into this. And uh, I think I want to start off by asking, what is television, right? I mean, a lot of you guys have probably been television engineers for a little while. And I decided to look up some stuff in the dictionary, right? Because the internet and dictionaries don't lie. So we have an electronic system of transmitting transient images or fixed or moving objects together with sound over a wire or through space by apparatus that converts light and sound into electrical waves and reconverts them into visible light rays and audible sound. OK, that, that sounds about right. Or of course, oops, I'll go back, an actual television set, of course. We know what these are. They've changed a little bit and gotten a lot flatter, but we know what a TV is. And then of course, the industry, the television industry, whatever that means at a given moment. You know, it's obviously a means, a medium of communication. That's a part of what television is. And then let's look at what broadcast is, because this is something a lot of people you know, think they know what it means. I like this definition, to scatter or sow as seed over a broad area. We, we broadcast seeds. Um, to make widely known, to transmit or make public by means of radio or television. OK, so now we all know what television and broadcasting is. So traditional broadcasting. I, heard several conversations this uh, evening that kind of were about this kind of subject. You generally have something like one of these, and it kind of goes out to a few of these things. And we all know how that works. There's transmitters and used to be, you know, waves to the air. It still is for those several people who watch ATSC. Um, you know, it's evolved a little bit over the years. We launch things into space and, you know, send that to receiving stations and then pipe that. That's, I think, the first cable box that my family owned in like 1983. Really liked the wood paneling, you know? Old TV gear was all about the wood paneling. I'm, I'm, I'm a, an appreciator of that aesthetic. And then, of course, you know, we've got, you know, direct uh, satellite reception. That's a, a means of receiving television broadcasts, of course. That's still in pretty wide use. And um, you know we had broadcasters. We're in the large facility of a broadcaster right now. We know what broadcasters are. They are the people who basically own the means of broadcasting all of these moving pictures and sounds and communications. Um, you know they have licenses basically, whether it's radio spectrum. They have the license to dig up your community and lay cables and get you these signals. And then because of that, because they own that stuff or control it, they get to control the content that you get. OK, this is how broadcast has worked for many years now. Pretty straightforward. But something funny has been happening since, for most people, the mid-90s. Um, for me, because I'm kind of a geek, a little bit earlier than that. And it was called the internet and us actually using it. And instead of this kind of one-to-many direct broadcast, as everyone knows it, it kind of looks something more like this. And <laughs> this is actually a map of the internet, right? And they, they actually publish these every year. They're kind of pretty, I think. But it obviously is very different, you know, you know, topologically. 
um, because it's not one person spouting a standard series of signals to everybody. It's everybody connected with everybody, communicating with everybody in every possible direction. It's a network and a very complex one and one that's changing literally every moment. So the internet has obviously been growing since the mid-90s as far as most consumers are familiar with it. And what's interesting is that the broadcasters kind of like realized something interesting was happening. And so they've decided maybe we should be ISPs, right? Maybe we should get in on this internet business. Um, the landline phone companies decided that they wanted to be ISPs. We've got the cable companies, again, used to be in just the broadcasting business, but they're like, ah, oh, we should get people this internet thing because that'll be a good idea and we'll make some money off of it. Obviously, even cellular phone companies now, we have all data connections in our pockets 24 hours a day, 23. Um, and then the satellite companies as well. All of these broadcasters basically were like, let's use these networks that we built out and get in on this internet thing, because that'll be good for us. So let's look at what's going on with the internet, right? It's getting faster and faster every year. Um, I just throw some of these metrics out here. You know, broadband used to be a megabit. For a lot of people now, it's 10 megs. For a lot more people these days, it's approaching 50 or 100 megs. A lot of it's bi-directional as well. And we have folks like Google who are rolling out gigabit networks. Frankly, there's a lot of countries in the world that are a little more population dense than the United States where people kind of take for granted gigabit connections to the internet these days. So we know that our landline connections, thanks to these ISPs, are getting awfully fast. But I'm actually personally a little more interested in what's going on with cellular data networks because they're getting kind of crazy too. And a few years ago, a you know 2.5G connection on your cellular telephone was 20 kilobits. For a lot of folks, 3G meant about a couple of megabits down. Now we're on this like fake 4G as I call it because it's not really a 4G spec yet. But well, people have a way of influencing you know, engineering groups to changing definitions through money. And so we call it 4G now, but it's, it's really 3.9G or 3.75G. And for a lot of folks on my phone, this means about 20 megabit connection. And you give it a few more years, and they're even saying that this is going to be rolling out in 2013, 2014. You have a new generation of cellular data network called LTE Advanced. It's the first true fourth general, uh, generation cellular, uh, cellular data technology. And it's going to be a few hundred megabits per second in your pocket every moment of the day. So it's, I think it's very funny that we think of networks and the internet in terms of tubes and pipes and these things that you plug into other things, a physical connection and cable. And really, now it's like literally flowing through our bodies every moment of the day. The internet is just out there always and constantly accessible and getting very, very fast. So all of these networks that are in place that kind of were originally for broadcast, obviously, you know, they, they transitioned into becoming about delivering packets of data and turning video instead of just signals that are flowing over traditional broadcast networks. Let's packetize this. And this is, you know, as you guys know, IPTV, sending video or, and or audio as packets, basically, you know, delivered over IP networks. And you know, there's been a lot of things that have made this a lot easier and better and more reliable. As those bandwidths have increased, we can send a lot more video and audio packets. So the quality has gotten very good. And in that same time frame, we've also had very, very you know, advanced development of compression codecs. So the amount of bandwidth we have available is going like this, but the amount of space it takes to cram good quality audio and video into packets is going like this. So this is why Netflix is like something like half of all internet traffic every evening in the United States, because people like watching their video as packets. And then, of course, the streaming protocols themselves. They're advancing dramatically. You know, people aren't just using standard transport streams to get these packets to end viewers on the internet. It's all about adaptive streaming technologies that can determine the bandwidth that an individual viewer has available moment to moment and can adapt at the bit rate as need be. And this, is, this has all been good. It's uh, you know, a very new way, in a sense, of delivering this type of media. And you know, IPTV originally and largely started being used really just within the broadcasting facilities. Let's pipe transport streams around instead of it just being uncompressed signals over you know, either analog or you know, SDI or HDSDI cable or 3G or whatever. You know, let's actually use 
packets between our servers and systems within the facility. We're starting to see more, and someone was telling me, I think uh, PVI is even doing this now with coupled uh, you know, cellular data uh, modems you know, actually replacing satellite microwave transmission from the field with just IP networks over even the public cellular data networks. And then, of course, getting actual video to customers has essentially all become IP television in the sense that it's no longer just tapping into a little bit of frequency on your cable connection or, or over the air. You're getting streams of data packets if you're a consumer of media on essentially any type of platform, whether that's a set-top box that Comcast or Verizon has given you, or you're watching TV on your computer. It's all you know, packets of data. So we have the ISPs that have kind of come out of the broadcast world. And they want you to pay for the content packages that they always were the providers of. A lot of them either charged you for it, like a cable broadcaster, or um, maybe they were making their money off of selling advertising. And so these ISPs, there's this interesting dynamic that's developing or developed as the broadcasters became ISPs, but are still kind of a bit latched on to this idea that they want to be the gatekeepers of content and monetize that and be the people who actually make the money off of that transaction. So we'll get more into this in a moment. So we talked a little bit about how the internet is progressing and how that's led to IPTV technology. The computer itself has evolved a little bit since the mid-90s when I started using them heavily. Um, and it went from something like this. This is a 286, which is fairly representative of the first computer I ever really personally geeked out with and was on the internet with. And um, I was really proud of my 286, by the way, because it ran at 16 megahertz instead of 12 megahertz. And it really had a 42 megabyte hard drive instead of a 40 megabyte hard drive. And that could fit like so much more random stuff on it. It was great. But that's what this was you know, in 1995, even a little earlier, 94, 93, maybe 92 286s. We kept ours for a while. And I'm going to submit that the average computer that most people are familiar with today is a lot more like this, because it's the one you're using constantly all day long. Or this. Or even this thing, a smart television, which everyone at CES is trying to hawk this year and last. And so this, I'm going to submit, is the computers of today. They're all obviously evolving in this direction. So what, what are they? What's the common variables in these computers that we have? Well, they're basically big screens and touch screens at that. But that's what they are. A computer has just become a screen. Um, they're inherently very good at playing video. That's what a lot of people do with them. They watch video on them. They're basically on the internet broadband all of the time for most people. So they're constantly connected to basically everything in the world. And the other interesting thing is that they typically have at least one, maybe multiple high definition cameras built into them and microphones and a variety of other types of sensors. So they know where they are. They know what they're looking at. They're listening to you. They're watching you. But I'm not a conspiracy theorist anymore. So I submit that's what today's computer is. It's a big screen with high definition cameras that's always on the internet. So video on the internet today, which there's a little bit of, because it's the majority of traffic on the internet any day, um, what are some facts about it? Well, anyone can get to video on the internet, and anyone can contribute video on the internet. Um, video on the internet basically exists in two modalities. The traditional one of broadcast, which is when the broadcaster wants to give it to you for live programming or pre-scheduled programming that you have to tap into when you know, it's at that point in the schedule. But of course, this whole new methodology of on-demand content, which means I want to define what I want to watch from whom at any given moment. And that's kind of becoming, I think, the new expectation for a user who wants video these days. And again, video is kind of a very inherent part of today's internet. Frankly, I know when I go to a web page now, a news website, you know, something like that, and there isn't video on it, that actually seems like an anomaly now. Whereas even a few years ago, 
you know, text and some pictures and some graphics kind of constituted the web experience. Well, now the web experience means video. So, you know, we have big players that a lot of people are familiar with for on-demand content. They're basically exclusively oriented around on-demand with some exceptions and anyone can contribute to this for free. You know, they might make some money off of it in the process, but anyone can put their internet, their video on the internet. And if you want to do live, you have services that are willing to let you put live high def video on the internet to every eyeball on the planet for free. Again, they're trying to make some money off of it in the process. So what's happening here is that I would submit that what we're seeing is the rise of something that I would call the internet television broadcaster. Because of course the, the theme that I'm making here, the, the, the point is, is that I think all of these computer devices that are big screens are televisions. When you just look at the broad definition of the word, why not just say, well, it's basically what television is now. And for someone who wants to put video on the internet and it can hit every eyeball on the planet, well, I'd say that's being a broadcaster in today's parlance. That is being a broadcaster. It's not WHYY being a broadcaster necessarily, although they're obviously doing this stuff too, but I think this is television and broadcasting. So now you have these outfits that are emerging that are internet broadcasters. They've never done cable distribution. They've never gone over the air. They just started as a broadcaster purely through the internet. Folks like Revision 3, who just got bought by Discovery Communications, CollegeHumor.com, client that we're doing some consulting for right now, the New York Times. They're just doing a daily news podcast broadcast on the internet through their website. Of course, a Netflix, I would say, is basically an internet television broadcaster. Amazon is in that space. Apple is in that space. All of these technology companies, I think, are today's emerging internet broadcasters. So, but there's this issue that's going on here. Uh, and it's really what the heart of this thing over the top means. And it's very disruptive to this entire industry, which is that you know, what over the top you know, connotates is that if you're a content creator, you can just ride on this internet that's already there that you really probably didn't have to invest anything in in terms of the infrastructure and just get your content out there like for free in the case of YouTube or live stream or whatever. It's just you can go over the top of this thing that's already there. You can go over the top of the paywalls that the traditional broadcasters erected to get you to pay for content through them. So these over-the-top broadcasters are just like, we're going to use this internet thing, we're going to make some money off of it, and we're going to use the pipes that you laid. So ha ha. And the big thing about this is that these fairly powerful broadcast and distribution entities can potentially get cut out of making money off of video that flows over their own networks, even though they were the broadcasters in the fir first place that decided to become ISPs. I think it's kind of ironic. Um, and they're not happy about this. And you hear, uh, you read articles about people cutting the cord, which is funny because, again, we're saying a lot of it's wireless now, but I'm going to cut the cord on buying cable television from a Comcast, say, and I'm going to just get my content over the internet and n either pay nothing for it or just go straight to the content producers and pay them and leave out paying a tax to the middleman other than the basic fee of being on the internet. So in other words, these guys, I seem to think one of them has a pretty big building in this town, um, <laughs> they're really, in my opinion, at risk of becoming this, a utility for packets, and they don't want to be that because it makes them a lot less money than being a utility for packets and making lots and lots of money off of content. You know, they don't just want to be pipes to the internet. They want to collect money for getting you exclusive content and making you pay a lot for it. And the big traditional broadcaster slash ISP entities, a la Comcast and Verizon, um, they're not kind of going down easily as far as just seeding this profit center out to every little guy who wants to put a cat video on the internet. 
you know, they are, they are doing some good things. Um, you know, they have their own internet offerings, and I know that I am a Comcast subscriber, and I watch all of my Comcast TV through my computer, through their Xfinity web page. So they're trying to do these services that kind of compete with other over the top for those people who are already sitting in front of their computer and maybe want to, you know, consume some paid content that way. I'd submit that they're also fighting things like net neutrality, uh, the idea that if you are an internet service provider and you've paid for the infrastructure, you shouldn't be able to prioritize certain packets over others. Say, make it so you get better quality video and no bandwidth caps if it's content that you're paying for that they're collecting that fee for. You know, so they're fighting net neutrality efforts, I think largely out of fear of over the top broadcast. The bandwidth caps, again, to make sure that well, if you're watching other people's video, we're going to cut you off at a certain point. And I think we're going to see a lot more with bandwidth caps you know, over the next year or two. So we've established that the traditional broadcasters, ISPs, are not happy and not necessarily a winner in this new ecosystem. But there are winners. And this is what I'm really excited about. Because content producers, who have great amounts of flexibility in getting good content to people these days, it's trivial to do so. I mean, I can shoot a video now and be streaming it to the internet. So obviously, for people producing content, there's essentially no barrier anymore to getting it out there. I think that a big power base that's going to emerge in this new landscape is the internet video advertising syndicate or network. There's a lot of little companies that are rising up that are all about doing very intelligent ad insertions into internet video streams. You know, so in a year or two, I won't be seeing ads for, I don't know, anything that involves cooking or a kitchen, because that's not relevant to me. I'll be seeing something that's probably very specific to web pages that I was just surfing five minutes ago. So I think these people are going to become very powerful in this new over-the-top video distribution world. Content aggregators. I hate to reference him, but Matt Drudge and the Drudge Report, as far as at least being an aggregator for other types of content, I do read the Drudge Report, by the way. But and I hate to admit that publicly, but I do. Um, but people who are basically there and just saying, oh, you probably like this. You know, Here's 50 things that you'll probably like today, because I'm figuring out a way to sit around at home all day long just trolling through all of the video content on the internet. And I'm going to appeal to a little community of users with a niche set of interests. And, throw up some ads so I make some money. So you know, in a sense, what broadcasters used to be were content aggregators of a sort. But now anyone can be a content aggregator and kind of take on one of those significant roles that broadcasters used to have. Um, CDNs, content delivery networks on the internet, they're not going away. And they're going to keep making money piping packets around the internet. And then, of course, device manufacturers like Apple who are you know, like the most profitable, valuable company on the planet today. Because apparently, people like these new internet connected television sets and are willing to pay a lot of money every month to have one. But there are losers given over the top. You know, as I was saying, the old guard of content producers who are locked into older business models and have a hard time competing with cat videos on YouTube. And I, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I go to a lot of conferences with folks who are like from HBO. And HBO has the HBO Go app, which you can have on your tablet or your computer screen and watch things from HBO. But the irony is they make you enter in you know, your name and password from your cable provider or whatnot to prove that you're actually paying for a television service, a bundle. And it's like, well, why should I have to do that? Shouldn't I just be able to give HBO 10 bucks a month or whatever and just get their video directly from them on the internet? The problem is they're locked into a business model. And to transition to this new direct distribution you know, method would be incredibly disruptive to them. So they're SOL. But if a new HBO were to arise that's not locked into an existing business model, they can kind of start off fresh and do what they want to do. And I'd submit that the more intelligent thing probably to do right now would be to offer that content directly to end users. So, the traditional content distributors, they're not, they're not loving this whole direct distribution over the internet of video kind of thing. So you know, how do you do it? It's really easy to put your video on the internet. You know, one of the things that we do as a systems integrator is we do you know, encoders, um, streaming encoders, live encoders. And you could get one from like 
a high vision or many other companies, including uh, like eight people who are here, I think, sell them. And you just do your live streaming and you pipe it out, you spit it at a CDN if you want to, they distribute it around the internet and psh, you're doing live broadcast to about you know, four billion souls on the planet if they happen to be tapping into it and you want to pay for that bandwidth. And then of course there's just file-based encoding. One of the companies that we represent is you know, Elemental or you know, Telestream and many, many other file-based encoding companies. You just you know, take your video files, turn it into an internet-friendly codec and again, pop it on YouTube, send it to Akamai or another CDN, and it's out there. That's all you had to do. It's pretty trivial, and it's very cheap. So, you know, again, typically, if you're getting to a lot of people right now, you really need an Akamai, a Limelight network, a CDN, someone who's got a lot of infrastructure and edge servers, so there's no latency when you're hitting people all over the, the geographic internet, if you will. And so they're an important part of an over-the-top infrastructure, of course, but other than paying them a monthly fee for bandwidth, you don't really have to do much in order to take advantage of them. I'd also say that web developers are a big part of this new fangled means of broadcast and distribution because this is the experience many people are getting video through now. It's through a website, it's through HTTP and various streaming protocols. So web developers are you know, a very useful type of software engineer in this new video ecosystem. And then app developers, you know, apps for smart televisions, apps for smartphones and tablets. You know, I think apps are a very important part of this in that they are kind of becoming the new channel. You know, when I'm on my iPad, I'm bouncing between apps and effectively it's kind of like flipping channels, except it's obviously a much richer experience because it has interactivity and knowledge and can have many forms of advertising embedded into it. They know about you as a user. You've probably logged into it. So unless you're one of the lucky people with a Nielsen box, your television doesn't really know much about you. Of course, Comcast probably does through their set-top box. But, you know. but what, you know, what an app would know about you could potentially be much greater. I mean, because it could know about all sorts of consumption patterns that you have. So, you know, apps, I think, are going to be a great means for expanding advertising. And there's going to be whole new advertising models that arise. So, you know, and I gave this talk at NAB headquarters where the DC chapter meets. So I, there's a little blurb about NAB here. But, you know, I frankly think that an organization like Simpty, to stay relevant in television now, needs to be very open to kind of accepting perhaps that you know, the definition of television might mean tablets and such and, uh, and that it's internet distribution and not necessarily towers and satellites and cable networks, but that this is a good thing, that this is what broadcasting is becoming. And you know, an organization like NAB needs to understand that broadcaster might mean something very different right now than it did 30, 40 years ago and that unless they kind of can look out for the interests of newfangled broadcasters, they might not be as relevant moving forward. Um, and, you know, we know what happens when an organization that has a large foothold and a whole way of doing things kind of doesn't pay attention to the internet. You might turn into these guys who <laughs> apparently used to be in the business of delivering mail to people. They're struggling with that these days. I say that they are a client, we love them dearly, but they, they, you know, they're having their own financial problems. And I always wonder, why didn't the, well, that's a big part of it, but why didn't the Postal Service decide at some point they wanted to like own email and they wanted to sell email stamps and like get in on that? And I think it's just because not enough people kind of made that paradigm leap. And I think in a similar way, the, the traditional world of broadcast kind of needs to make a paradigm leap. and be very friendly towards internet broadcasting and understand that these new technologies are a big part of broadcast and will be, I would say, by the end of the decade, the way that broadcast takes place. I think, and it's probably well before the end of the decade, but I think, you know, within a few years, most television consumers will be getting their video through over-the-top services. I think that's, frankly, all Apple has to do is release something that shines and people will buy it and it'll probably change a whole industry like it did, they did with music. So, you know, be warned, I don't think the broadcast industry ought to go this way. There's definitely an evolving engineer skill set. 
got to be computer friendly, comfortable with software, because software is a big part of this. It's not all just boxes with some LEDs. It's getting under the hood with software, which is a very different beast. Networking savvy, obviously, and being very comfortable with TCP IP, routing, DNS, you know, IPv6, all of these, uh, all these fun technologies, I would say are part of the new broadcast engineer skill set. Um, you need to know a lot about streaming protocols and codecs. You know, again, you, you know, we were talking earlier, with, with ATSC, kind of got locked into MPEG-2, and it's going to be that for a while. Well, with internet video, you know, new codecs are coming out all the time. They're already talking about H.265, and there's a new you know, transport protocol that people are trying to work on called MPEG-Dash. And, you know, these, you know, wait six months, and it'll be H.266 or whatever, you know. So being very on top of the streaming protocols and the codecs is very important. You have to be adaptable. You have to always be looking ahead because this isn't going to be the 20-year transition from NTSC to ATSC. It's like things change every you know, six months. But the good news is, is that I think the world of OTT internet needs good, grounded broadcast engineers. Because frankly, a lot of the video quality is garbage. And a lot of the people producing this content don't know anything about producing good television. So there needs to be this meeting of the minds, I would say. And also, standards. Organizations like SIMPTE, very good at standards. Internet, not always so good at maintaining and publishing standards and getting people to agree on things. So again, I think that sensibility is really important and will be really valuable for an organization like SIMPTE to bring to bear in this new world. Um, designing for reliability and uptime with redundancy in mind, again, very common kind of practice in the world of broadcast engineering. Less people in the world of IT and over the top and streaming, especially end users or content producers, even like know how to build IT systems with these types of principles in mind, which is a shame because it software can be flaky and you know off the off the shelf servers and whatnot can be really flaky. And so, you know, having that kind of sensibility, again, it's something that this new world of broadcasting needs dearly from people like you guys who have had to engineer systems for years with these types of principles. It's, you know, broadcast has never expanded. You know, everyone talks about, oh, broadcast, it's going down the crapper. You know, there isn't as much advertising money or whatever. I would say it's the best years ever of the broadcast industry if you accept that people watching video on an iPad in bed at night is a broadcast and television experience. These are like the glory years. This is like the precipice of the gl most glorious age of broadcast where I think it's actually transforming more into a genuine communications medium than just let's spit content at people and maybe they'll suck up some ads. So I, I think it's a great time to be a broadcaster and a broadcast engineer because this is really revolutionary stuff. Um, when I did this talk you know, a few months ago, a couple things that had just happened was this anti-Islamic video that popped up on YouTube that now retroactively, I guess, didn't end up getting our, our, um, our um, um, the guy killed in, um, in Libya, but it caused you know, a lot of uproar. And so the idea that you can kind of cause a ruckus with video on the internet is pretty well established. And again, we know what's happened retroactively here, but there was a little internet video that went out about Romney saying something about 47% that was fairly impactful of the last election cycle. So again, I think it's pretty safe to say that video delivered on the internet has a big impact and can't be kind of just, it's all just cat videos because it's, it's a lot more than that. So what is a television in the 21st century? It could be one of these. A set-top box, but maybe not from your Comcast or cable provider. A smart television with all that stuff baked into it. Maybe it's you sitting in front of your laptop. And I think that's television in the 21st century. So thank you very much. My contact information, please, by all means, feel free to listen to the Workflow Show. It's quasi-entertaining. Here's an interesting point. Uh, a major television station here in Philadelphia, I was just talking to them. They were telling me when they read a story on the news, they may do a 30 second one, but they're now cutting a two and a half to three minute version for the web, and they're getting 100 more views per video story on the web now, on their website, than they are on the broadcasting. And starting next month, they're going to be producing twice as many videos specifically for the web than they are for the broadcasting. Even though they broadcast news five, six hours 
a day, they're finding they're getting more viewership now off the web than they are off the broadcast. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And I think you know, the predominant number of their viewers, if they're producing decent content and putting more energy into the content, will probably be web-based in a few years and on demand. You know, again, it's on demand, so I don't have to fit into a broadcast schedule. Well, that's the other thing they said, too. Once it's broadcast, at the end of the day, it's done. Here, they leave it up for about a month, and they can, it still tracks. Yes? You talked about your emphasis there toward the end was about setting standards. Standards organizations like Cinti and such. But yet, what's happening today is the manufacturers are setting the de facto standards. And the problem with organizations like Cinti is it takes two years or three years to get and review a standard. And by that time, in, in this business, it's old news. You know, it, 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 it almost becomes a joke. And, and you've got the Sonys, you've got the, um, you've, you've got the Apples, you've got Samsung, you know, out there setting the standard to make a profit. And they want to do something different that will ace everybody else out. Well, and one might even so say, real real yeah, and you look at a, a group like MPEG, right, you know, which defines a lot of internet streaming and codec, you know, well, there's, then there's MPEG-LA, which is really just a licensing scheme for a consortium of for-profit corporations that may have a patent stake in those standards that they kind of consorted together to develop. So, yes, that's a big struggle. That's a big problem. And I guess, you know, I, I don't mean to just brush it under the carpet, uh, carpet and say, adaptability and being able to be kind of ahead of the curve and aware of trends and very on top of changes is very important but you know I, I think as you said to stay relevant in this world you kind of have to find a way right to be able to cater to the cutting edge and still I think try to try to impart some sense of standard to, to end users and that may mean working more in tandem with commercial entities like an Apple or an Adobe or a Google than, than it had in the past. That, that just may be inherent now. I don't know. Someone else said something interesting when I did this talk in DC. They said, well, a lot of people are having a hard time making money off of delivering video through the internet versus more traditional means of broadcast. And I said, yeah. And, wouldn't it be kind of crazy if it just turned out that all this internet video technology inherently was just less commercial a thing than traditional broadcast? That would freak some people out. And, you know, who knows? It, we're in the baby stages here. As I like to tell people, you know, the internet in general is like being five years, ten years into the invention of the printing press, except way more impactful than the printing press. So we'll see where it goes. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.